Hey folks, uh, sorry for the late start. Uh, hopefully everyone is here. Let me know in the chat if you are uh, reading this loud and clear and how are th how things are going. Uh, where's everyone connecting from? And uh, hopefully everyone's got a drink here. <laughs> I see people going, oh, beard. I haven't decided on the beard yet. I will probably, uh, during extra life, probably do something and go, hey, um, the people want the beard to stay. Now, I should note, I can probably negotiate for as long as November. But after that, my wife has opinions. And those opinions are uh, not liking the beard. So uh, I see we've got people from Lethbridge. Uh, so that's right close by. Uh, Nashville, UK, Dallas, Denmark, Kentucky. So right near uh, DUI guy. Houston, Alabama. I see uh, gulping cider. That's a good one. And uh, here from Virginia and drinking uh, zero Dr. Pepper. So lots of police people from all over the place. Uh, some Albertans from Calgary and uh, just uh, from Alberta, from Mexico. Somebody saying beard. Yeah, I don't know how... Uh, how much this is sort of going to be a, a lasting thing, but I might be able, might be able to neg negotiate it uh, lasting through to uh, the end of November. But I think after that, I'm going to run into trouble. Uh, and I see Brentwood Sheik. Thank you for the uh, new membership here. So uh, somebody's asking, do you have uh, Movember in Canada? Um, yes. Although right now I'm doing the, uh, tomorrow, so um, I guess starting later tonight, so November 5th from midnight to midnight, uh, I'm going to be doing an extra live stream for charity, which is going to be uh, video gaming. Uh, I see the beard isn't gray. It's got plenty of gray in it, but it's a little less gray than the, uh, the hair on the head. So um, we'll see how that. Uh, so and I see a vote on Mrs. Runkle's side. Yeah, so. Uh, and, uh, somebody's noting that I'm looking and sounding much better. I'm not a hundred percent, but I'm getting there. Uh, still got a lot of sort of crud in the lungs. So, um, that's sort of slowly working on getting rid of that. And now this is defocused. We'll see if we can get it to, uh, focus in again. All right. So, um, uh, I got about, uh, hour and 45 minutes here before uh, Friday Night Frenzy starts up. And then I also have to go run some errands in order to pick up stuff for uh, the whole extra life thing, which is 24 hours is going to be rough. I got to pick up all the energy drinks, like all the energy drinks. I've got some booze. I've got some, uh, you know, I need still snacks, but uh, yep. Uh no, I, I've got to get my uh, snow thrower fixed. I, I've got a snow thrower, but I let it uh, sort of gum up with old gas. So I've got to figure that out. Uh, Jeremy Morton, thank you for the new membership. And uh, so he's saying 24 hours starting when? Uh, midnight. So it's going to be midnight to uh, midnight to midnight. And I see. So is that no to lawyers and dragons? There will be lawyers and dragons. Um, and I'm going to be on it. And while I'm there, I'm just going to be throwing up a, uh, here I've, I can show you the overlay that I set up for when I'm at Lawyers and Dragons. So, um, so when it's extra life, that's what I'll be throwing up here. And then I'll be back because it's 24 hours of, uh, of gaming and that includes some D and D. So rare in the, rare in the history. Thank you for the membership. Uh, somebody's asking, what is all the notwithstanding clause talk from Trudeau? I'll talk about that for, uh, what is it, uh, on another one. But today, let's uh, let's go through this brief because it is uh, worth looking at. All right. So let me just bring this up here. Hopefully you guys can see that. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so, um, and I see, please invite Kurt to come back to Lawyers and Dragons. Um, Kurt, I'm not in charge of sort of the who the guests are, but, uh, you know, Kurt was a lot of fun. So, uh, 
All right. Now, I think this is kind of interesting here. This is a weird font, and I'm wondering if that's required. Um, like, does the court require this font for the Court of Appeals? Because where I am, they're very particular about fonts. And if I tried to bring in this font, they would kind of, they would reject it. So I'm wondering if, uh, if Virginia has a different rule for that. And uh, see, still need squirrel on Lawyers of Dragons. Uh, I think that should happen. And, uh, but again, I'm not in charge, but I've got a plan for uh, getting squirrel in on some gaming. I just need, need to be better for, for all of that. So that's going to, uh, that's going to happen. All right. I kind of bring this one up here, Ingrid Steen. Now you look like one of my old guinea pigs. I'm sure he wouldn't object if he saw a picture of her. She was amazing, so it's a good thing. Promise. Uh, I wasn't sure where that comment was going, but uh, fair enough. So a, a complimentary comparison to uh, to a uh, guinea pig. So that's a good thing. Yeah, Emily supposed earlier that all the formats are prescribed by the court. That would be my guess, too. Um, it seems a little unusual that they would, you know, prescribe that weird font, but I also can't see them deciding to use that font just on their own. And, uh, I see Potter update, uh, requests. So Potter is doing great. He is running around. He is causing all sorts of trouble. Um, he seems to be just, he's way better than, uh, than he was pre-surgery. So he is, uh. He's doing great. So uh, now we're back to having to uh, run after Potter. And uh, I want to I want to take the GoPro and like mount it onto Potter and run him at the off leash park just so that people could uh, could see that because I think people would appreciate that one. All right. So uh, so we've got statement of the case and different jurisdictions have different ways of doing appellate briefs and so forth. And I kind of like this one because basically uh, where I am, I would do something very similar in an appellate brief. This is sort of an introduction as just kind of an overview. And I really like that because you want to give the court some, some notion of where you're going before you dig into the details of the argument. So I, uh, I approve of this entirely. And if it's not required by the format restrictions, then, uh, then I think that this is uh, fantastic. So, and I see uh, their dog harnesses for GoPros just saying, I've got one, like it's sitting right there. I actually have to repair it a little bit because uh, uh, Zora, when she was in it, she was very good at chewing things, chewing her way out of it. But uh, Potter puts up with a little better. All right. So they note here, six week jury trial, which is of course insane. Um, and I see he still take it easy with Potter for at least a year, vet ortho tech for 30 years. Fair enough. Um, so the this is, because this is Depp's appeal, this is actually limited to one specific issue, uh, which is, or one specific sort of finding, which is the Waldman defamation claim. That's the 2 million that, uh, that sort of, uh, that was kind of the countervailing claim there. And now I don't think this is about money at the end of the day, because we haven't seen Depp made any moves to try to uh, claim on this money and so forth. But I think that this is really just that he wants to sell the point uh, that Depp did nothing wrong. That's really what this is about. So, all right. So this is, as mentioned, about the, uh, you know, the Waldman statements claiming Ms. Hurd's claims of abuse were false. And this is a claim of vicarious liability. Now, vicarious liability is an interesting uh, thing. And somebody's saying, is this hosted via StreamYard? It is. Um, not sure why you're asking, but yes, it is. Uh, vicarious liability is kind of an interesting point because what it uh, amounts to is that employers can be liable for the torts of their employees. And so as an example here, 
uh, let's say there's a trucking company, right? And this trucking company uh, operates a lot of dump trucks. Now that that dump truck then turns around and runs over, you know, let's make this not gruesome. They lose control of the dump truck and it crashes into the front of your house, causing a bunch of damage, right? And you've got to fix that. So the question then becomes, who pays for this? Because the truck driver probably has no money, right? And so what you really want as the homeowner is you want to go beyond the truck driver to the trucking company because that's where the money lives. And vicarious liability basically says that when an employee in the course of doing their work somehow commits a tort, the larger company is responsible. So as another example, uh, let's say that you are, uh, you've headed over to, you know, Walmart or something. And an employee has decided, you know what, I'm just not going to clean up this mess. You know, this slippery, somebody spilled some oil. Uh, I'm not going to clean this up. And you happen to be walking along. There's no like wet floor. Um, and you slip on it and you, in, you know, you break your hip. Uh, you you don't really necessarily want to sue the employee whose job that was because they're making minimum wage. They've got no savings. There's nothing there. You want to go after Walmart. So that's, again, a vicarious uh, liability sort of aspect. And I see Janie Wallace. Please don't use that example as it happened here in Glasgow and it killed people. I mean, it happens everywhere that uh, trucks lose control and so forth and are owned by companies. Although I did specifically pick a property damage example here, uh, just because of uh, just because of that aspect. So, and I see, look for the deep pockets. Absolutely, that's what you're trying to do, right? You always want. There's no point suing somebody who's got no money. You know, if a homeless guy keys your car, sure you could sue him for the damage to your car, but he's never going to pay. It's not going to not going to help you out there. So, chameleon, thank you for the new membership there. And uh, let's uh, sort of have a look here. All right. So Depp filed a motion for summary judgment on the single count counterclaim and the court denied the motion. Uh, the court was very much wanting to have all of this stuff going to uh, uh, going to the jury. And so then there was the very lengthy trial. And at the end, Depp, Mr. Depp made a motion to strike her claims, which was also denied and renewed such motion on May 26th, which was also denied. So repeatedly tried to strike this counterclaim. And then the jury retired to deliberate and returned its verdict, which overwhelmingly favored Mr. Depp, but overwhelmingly was not, uh, you know, was not exclusively because they found in favor of Ms. Heard on the third Waldman statement. That's the only statement at issue in this appeal. Now, um, you know, they note that they're not uh, they're not appealing the 10 million or the 5 million. I can't see why they would, because A, they won a substantial chunk of change on that. And B, I don't think, you know, there's been no signs that Johnny Depp is looking at pursuing this money. Um, there's been no, um, no, you know, interest in that, apparently. Now, that doesn't mean that he couldn't turn around and decide to, but it doesn't seem to be about the money for Johnny Depp. It seems to be about the defamation issues. So I don't think he really cares how much money. He just doesn't want there to be any verdict against him. And that's, you know, absolutely his right to uh, pursue. And so they note here the introduction here. You know, they note that Mr. Depp prevailed on virtually all material issues and the verdict of the jury and the judgment of the trial court represent an intelligent and well-reasoned decision on the merits after a full and fair trial and should largely though not and should be largely though not entirely affirmed um so basically they're saying the jury did a good job and that's a great place to be i always you know whenever you're in an appeal this is where you want to be you want to be in the position of having most of the decision, you know, going in your favor. Um, I saw somebody in the chat saying that had Depp not, uh, 
had heard not appealed, the Depp probably wouldn't have appealed. And I think that's entirely likely as well. Because this lets him uh, file a little bit more in terms of what's going on here and uh, pursuing things. So they're they're just looking at the one uh, Waldman statement here. That's it. So uh, Mr. Depp does not appeal his verdict or the verdict on his claim, nor does he appeal the verdict in his favor on two of the three Waldman statements. So it's just that one statement. Buddy notes, Ms. Hurd's claim was fatally flawed and the trial court should have granted Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment and his motion to strike the evidence for three reasons. So we'll go through what these reasons are and have a look at them. And I see uh, Silver Gypsy Lady saying, uh, glad to see you, Ian. Hope you're feeling better. I'm feeling mostly better. Um, we'll see how I'm doing at the end of the, uh, the Extra Life live stream. Now, just so you guys are aware, during the Extra Life uh, live stream, I'm going to have uh, Super Chats turned off because uh, that should be going through the donation link. And so that I'll end up linking. I'll put that in the description and I will put that in the uh, as a pinned comment. But um, yeah, so during the 24-hour charity live stream, just because I don't want to, I don't want to have to sort out like, you know, like get the super chat, donate that. That's going to be a headache and a half. So, uh, yeah. And I see, uh, sure, liking the facial hair, you're too handsome to be hidden. Well, thank you. All right. So, uh, Ms. Hurd sought to hold Mr. Depp liable for the April 27 Waldman statement on a pure theory of vicarious liability, contending that Mr. Depp was liable merely because Mr. Waldman had been retained by Mr. Depp as his attorney and was therefore his agent. So this is going into the uh, the other aspect of, you know, of agency and vicarious liability, right? So as I mentioned, you know, an employee, typically there's a vicarious liability thing, but that doesn't necessarily uh, apply to everything. So uh, the further removed somebody is, the more likely it is that they're not going to be found to have a vicarious liability aspect. So as an example, let's say I order a pizza and I just happen to be working for Walmart, right? You know, I'm, let's say that I'm a Walmart executive and I'd be making a lot more money than I am now, but let's imagine this. And so let's say we're working late and we decide to order a pizza. And so they, you know, they're delivering this pizza and the pizza driver runs somebody over. Well, I've hired this pizza company to bring me a pizza. So there is some sort of relationship there, except that they're not an employee, right? I don't have any control over it. I don't have, you know, the control over whether that pizza company hires or fires this specific pizza delivery guy. I don't have control over the route. I don't have control over, you know, even how many pepperonis they put on, on the pizza. So at that point, holding me as, you know, vicariously liable uh, would be, would be unfair, right? Because it's not, um, uh, there's no sort of direct control. And I see, uh, what is the charity stream for? It is for Extra Life. Uh, so they do a charity uh, every certain on an ongoing basis, but they largely support children's hospitals. And the specific children's hospital that this is going to is the Stollery Children's Hospital here in Edmonton. Um, they do fantastic work. They've got an excellent reputation as a children's hospital. Um, friends of mine have had to take their kids there and say they've got excellent care. So um, that's... Uh, that's who this is going to be supporting and the charity like the uh, this goes directly to them. So there's no pledging here. We're just going to be donating because uh, yeah, that's uh, that's we're not going to be Amber herding this up. And I see Walmart so cheap they get pizza from their own deli. Yeah. So that's unpleasant. And yeah, there's a, a link there. Um, uh, yeah, and I see Extra Life is a way to gain funds for local children's miracle center hospitals. Money stays local. 
Uh, we are fundraising for a local hospital in Tucson. Yep. So that is, uh, they're, a, they're a great charity. Um, and it started off with gamers basically just saying, hey, you know what? Uh, we want to show that we we care about our communities and sort of trying to. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's a great cause. All right. So they don't. But as a matter of law, Mr. Waldman is an independent contractor whose allegedly tortious conduct is not automatically attributable to Mr. Depp. Now, uh, let's talk about sort of the difference between employee and agent and independent contractor. So an independent contractor is somebody you hire but still maintains a certain amount of independence, hence the name, in terms of their decision making and so forth. So let's say that I, you know, let's say I hire somebody to redo my driveway, right? And so I'm hiring a, you know, a company that does driveways. They do concrete, they do all of that, and they come out and they start working. Well, um, they're not my employees in a strict sort of usual sense, right? Because even though I'm paying them and I we've agreed that I'm going to get a driveway out of it, and it's probably a driveway to some particular specifications and some particular, you know, dimensions. And I might have, you know, specified materials and all of that. Uh, they still get to make the decision about how to how to go about doing it. Right. They can choose which employees to send and how many of them they can choose which, you know, equipment they're going to bring. You know, are they bringing one cement mixer or two? which, you know, which brands are they bringing? Um, who's paying the insurance, who's paying the health care, who's paying all of those things. I'm probably just paying the con, you know, the driveway guy, a lump sum of money. And then that person is then deciding how they pay their employees, what equipment they buy, what materials, where they buy those materials, all these kinds of questions. So this is somebody who is, uh, you know, they're exercising a lot more independence. And so, if they were to run somebody over with their cement truck, then at the end of the day, it's probably not the case that I'm on the hook because there's just too much separation there. So Mr. Waldman being an agent versus an independent contractor is going to be a really interesting question. We're going to be talking about sort of what, uh, what it means to be a lawyer in these filings. And that I think is, uh, is going to be interesting. I see a quick question here. I do have some super chats that I'll have to uh, catch up on here in a minute. Am I making an appearance on Law & Lumber's uh, Frenzy tonight? I hope to pop in at least for a bit, but I also need to get some sleep because uh, starting at midnight, I'm running 24 hours. So I will pop in for a little bit, but I'm not going to stay the whole uh, whole range. I got to get some, uh, you know, some bits there. Uh, I see. Can you please break the 24 hours into two separate streams? YouTube doesn't show anything longer than 12 hours for replay crew. That is good to know. I'll set a little timer to go break stream, new stream. Um, so I'll try to remember to do that. Uh, and somebody is also asking about Mrs. Runkle. Uh, she is doing a lot better than, uh, than I did. So she is uh, recovering a lot faster. All right. So they note, indeed, a wealth of authority support limiting a client's liability for allegedly tortious conduct uh, by an attorney, and the court should impose that same limit here. So this is important because this is a legal question. This is a strictly legal question and something that really should be determined by the judge and therefore is a lot more likely to be considered uh, by the Court of Appeal. All right. So uh, second, because Ms. Heard proceeded against uh, Mr. Depp at trial on a purely vicarious theory of liability, she was required to present evidence that Mr. Waldman committed each element of the tort of defamation, including that he acted with actual malice. No evidence of Mr. Waldman's actual malice was presented at trial, so the judgment against Mr. Depp cannot be sustained. So this is uh, fairly critical here, because if Mr. Waldman didn't actually commit the tort, then whether or not he's an agent or whatever else doesn't matter. So they're basically saying he didn't even do the tort. I see. So Runkle had man COVID. I tested positive for COVID. Uh, my wife hasn't. 
So it's entirely possible she got sick with something hopefully a little less serious. Third, the April 27th Waldman statement viewed in context is a non-actionable statement of opinion insufficient to support a claim uh, for defamation. So uh, they note, in addition to erroneously de uh, denying Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment and motion to strike, the trial court also aired in excluding from evidence the complete Daily Mail articles containing the Waldman statements and refusing to give jury instructions as to Mr. Waldman's status as an independent contractor. So it, I don't know if you guys remember at the trial, um, the when you saw the Daily Mail article, it was this big page of blacked out text with this one Waldman statement. But keep in mind, the jury's supposed to consider the Waldman statement in context. Well, how do you consider it uh, in context if they have blacked out everything else? Um, I see, does your Lawyers and Dragons away sign tell people where to find you? No, I've got to fix that. But um, yes, that will get fixed. All right, so assignments of errors. We already went over the assignments of errors on a previous uh, stream here. But basically, they're talking about the same things, but they're being a little more specific about the, uh, you know, which jury instructions they think should have been in there um, and so forth. And they also, I really like this. Uh, they did this. Amber Heard's team did not do this in their assignment of errors. But they note the specific moment, like specific areas where this was preserved. So awesome. All right, now statement of facts. Let's just talk about appellate work because in appeals, uh, you are presenting the facts of the case to the appeals court. And there's, you know, there's various, um, there's sort of various strategic aspects to this. One of them is that you're going to write a statement of facts to talk about like, here is the the factual matrix. Here's what's actually gone on for this appeal. And while they're going to have access to all of the transcripts, who in the chat thinks that the court of appeal is going to go through the transcripts in detail of six weeks of trial? Give me a, a one in the chat. If you think that you would want to do that as the appellate court. I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of, uh, I'm not seeing the chat explode with a whole lot of people going, hey, uh, you know, that's something I would, no, they want the summary. And so there's a bit of, I see some twos here and a zero. Uh, basically, when you're writing the summary of facts, what you want to do is you can't ever mislead the court. However, you can spin things. You can, you know, put a different kind of, framework on them and so basically the appealing party in some ways has an advantage because you can sort of spin it as much as you can before the other side has to stand up and say hey um you know this is this is too far like we have to amend the record you don't ever want to be caught uh with somebody going hey we think that this is improper what you're doing but you can, you know, absolutely say, you know, and try to put things in a in a light that is favorable to you. So we'll we'll talk about sort of the uh, the spin on that. And I see, wouldn't it be incorrect for the appeals court to examine the facts again? Isn't the jury supposed to be the arbiter finder of facts? Uh, yes and no, because um, sometimes there's questions like, was there any facts to support something? And then they gotta go through it. So. Uh, in connection with her counterclaim, Ms. Hurd contended a trial that Mr. Waldman, acting as Mr. Depp's agent, defamed her in three statements uh, to the United Kingdom tabloid, the Daily Mail. And uh, so the first uh, statement was quoted and said that Ms. Hurd had used uh, fake sexual violence allegations and promoted sexual violence hoax facts. And facts is itself in scare quotes there. Uh, that article contained a general uh, uh, discussion of the dispute and litigation between Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd and quotes from attorneys adverse to Mr. Depp. 
the jury did not find this statement to be defamatory. Second Waldman statement uh, noted that Ms. Hurd's allegations were a hoax. And uh, so they didn't find that to be defamatory either. The third one, the only one which they found was defamatory. Uh, and just looking at the, the line here. So it describes a recording of a phone call to the police on the night of May 21st, 2016. And so Herd's attorney says phone records and police department logs vindicate Herd's account of the final shocking episode of domestic violence she endured before filing for divorce, whereas Depp's legal team says this recording does the precise opposite. However, by raising discrepancies in the various accounts Heard and her allies have given to the notorious dust-up. Yeah, if you remember that during trial, there were a whole lot of witnesses talking about this. And um, it would have been nice if we heard the same story twice. Uh, noting that the domestic violence case ultimately fizzled when the two LAPD officers who responded uh, to the call said they never found any evidence of a crime. And then goes on to say, Depp's lawyer, Adam Waldman, said that the various discrepancies proved that nothing heard and her friends said about the events of May 21st, 2016 could be considered credible. And it sets out Mr. Waldman's uh, purportedly defamatory statement. Quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops, but the first attempt didn't do the trick. The officers came to the penthouses, thoroughly searched and interviewed, and left after seeing no damage to face or property. So Amber and her friends spilled a little wine and roughed the place up, got their story straight under the direction of a lawyer and publicist, and then placed a second call to 911. So you can see how that one is very, very specific, right? That one is very detailed. And I see uh, somebody noting in EDB's stream, she mentioned that Waldman was paid with a 1099. So that really shows that he was a contracted worker. Yep, although that's not necessarily determinative. Uh, and I see, uh, can you explain how they could find it defamatory if they didn't present anything and the police and Isaac did too? Uh, that's ultimately, you know, stuff we're going to be getting to here. Uh, there's also some notes about the source. They hate the Daily Mail. It's not a trusted source of anything. It's known as a uh, scare and hate-mongering newspaper. Yeah, I mean, the... Uh, Daily Mail does not have a fantastic reputation. Let's just take a second and uh, go through some of the super chats here. Diana B for energy during the long stream. Great cause. Thank you very much. Uh, Truffle Hound. Hey, Ian, are you going to get some sleep before Extra Life? Or is that too optimistic uh, to ask? By the way, chat, if you can, please donate. I will get some sleep. Uh, we'll see how much. Uh, Runkle, how are you feeling? Well, you can hear a little bit of... Uh... <coughs> little bit of uh, sort of cough. Um, I'm not 100%. My lungs are still um, sort of full of junk, but uh, it. I'm getting better, getting better. All right. So, but uh, we'll see. There's going to be a whole lot of gaming going on. So we'll see how that, uh, how I hold up. And they note, but even this didn't have the desired effect because two domestic abuse tr uh, trained LAPD police would later provide a pair of sworn depositions saying they saw no evidence of a crime. These lies about who made the call and when are just the tip of the iceberg, as the evidence will show in court. So uh, basically, the you know, this article was talking about, you know, these incidents and saying, hey, listen, um, Ultimately, the police investigated. They found that there was no, you know, abuse. So Ms. Hurd presented no evidence at trial that Mr. Depp was personally involved in directing or making any of the three Waldman statements. Indeed, Mr. Depp testified that he'd never even seen the Waldman statements prior to the filing of the counterclaim in August of 2020. So this is a bit of a problem here, right? It's purely that they're just reporting on... Uh, that their sort of claim here is purely that because Waldman made the statements and because he was an employee, uh, you know, an, an agent that, uh, therefore Mr. Depp is liable. So aunt Jeno, thank you very much for the membership. Uh, Lisa Randolph, thank you very much for the uh, super chat here. And I'm trying to, uh, you know, 
trying to uh I'm gonna try to be around a little bit more. Um Rose Harvey doesn't seem a good time to do a 24 hour gaming session when you're still under the weather. Look after yourself. Um, there's costs to putting it, uh, putting it off. And those costs are largely borne by the kids. So, um, I want to make sure that we, I want to try to make sure we get maximum fundraising for the kids. So, um, if I put it off to another day, it's going to, uh, it would impede that. And, I don't want to be sort of Amber Heard, uh, what is it, uh, you know, pledging to do something without following through. So Mr. Waldman has a professional license, is the owner and managing member of his own law firm, and provides legal services to his clients. Uh, he was retained by Mr. Depp in October and still represented Mr. Depp at the time of his trial uh, testimony. But Mr. Depp is not his only client. Uh, this is also important in terms of the, uh, this is an important aspect in terms of, you know, determining that relationship, right? Because if Mr. Depp was his only client, then you might say that it's more likely that there's an agency relationship. Uh, Mr. Waldman's relationship with Mr. Depp is solely one of attorney client, and he's represented Mr. Depp in various litigation matters, including his litigation uh, against Ms. Hurd. So that's also sort of a key uh, sort of thing there. And Mr. Waldman testified that while he believed he had some knowledge of the conduct of Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd, he never personally witnessed any interactions between them prior to his retention in October of 2016, which was after their separation. Mr. Waldman testified that he made each of the Waldman statements. Uh, Ms. Hurd did not provide any evidence on whether or why Mr. Waldman uh, believed each of his specific statements. So weather is important because, of course, we're talking about defamation. So there's aspects of uh, actual malice. And remember, actual malice comes to basically you knew or uh, or were reckless about whether or not what you were saying was true. It doesn't mean malice in the sense of like, you know, mustache twirling evil. All right. So, uh in response to a more general inquiry about uh, Ms. Hurd's allegations, however, Mr. Waldman testified at length on why he believed that Ms. Hurd's allegations against Mr. Depp were false, describing physical evidence and identifying multiple witnesses whose testimony he believed contradicted her allegations. I actually didn't think at the end of the trial, I was very surprised to see that there was that judgment on the Waldman statements. And I mean... Prior to that, I had made comments to say I thought that them calling Mr. Waldman was a, a major own goal because it let Mr. Waldman testify at length about how he thought that Ms. Hurd's claims were BS. So I was a bit surprised by that. You know, I was like, wow, they screwed that up. But I mean, I guess it got them two million at the end of the day, but we'll see if that holds. Um, all right. And so trial court aired in denying Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment and motion to strike the evidence. And a really important reason why they'd bring this is you don't really want to say the jury aired because the jury error, like a jury error is unlikely to be overturned by the court of appeal. Uh, the court of appeal does not want to overturn a jury error. Instead, uh, this is you're saying that the judge made a mistake, and so this is a much better, uh, it's a much more likely, you know, sort of argument there. All right. And I see, I thought this would be like a shot in the dark, but after EDB covered it, I was like, oh, maybe you'll get somewhere with this appeal. I think that there's actually, um, I think he's got some merit to this. I don't think that this is. You know, I see a lot of appeals and a lot of appeals, you look at them and you're just like, good luck. And I kind of expected that that's what I'd be doing today. But he's actually bringing some good arguments on this one. Um, I have been consistently impressed by Depp's legal team. Um, they, you know, they're not perfect. Nobody is perfect at all. So um, that is... There's, you know, there's no perfection here, but I, I'm impressed by the writing in this. 
it's persuasive, sort of I've got hiccups. And I think that the arguments they're making are good arguments to be making. All right. So in reviewing a, ru uh, a ruling on a motion for summary judgment or motion to strike, the court normally considers the relevant portions of the record in the light most favorable to the non-moving party and draws reasonable inferences in favor of the non-moving party. So what does that mean? Well, um, a motion to strike means that you want to knock out somebody else's claim. And so they're going to consider that in the in the light most opposed to the person who wants to knock out the claim. And the reason why is because you want to knock out the claim without hearing the evidence, right? You want to uh, you want to pitch it before you've heard everything. So that means that you're going to consider it sort of in the you're going to consider the claim that's being that they're trying to strike in the most favorable uh, party. Uh, and I see uh, the moving party wording is funny, considering someone now being stateless. Um, she's not actually stateless. Uh, she is basically saying that she, because statelessness in international law is a different thing. I mean, she's still, so far as I know, an American citizen. Uh, but so statelessness would be if she, she'd somehow renounced all of her citizenship. And even then, you usually can't renounce your citizenship unless you've got another citizenship to take up. Um, there's sort of limits on that because they don't really want stateless people. Uh, but statelessness can happen if you, for instance, are um, a citizen of a country that ceases to exist. That's a way that some people have become stateless. So uh, statelessness is real bad. But she is saying that she not doesn't reside in any particular state within the United States. And I, I've got to go over that one. It's just, it's hard because it's stupid. And I don't think that the claim is likely to succeed. And so I'd much rather read something like this because there's actually an argument that is not so ridiculous and offensive to the, you know, to sensibilities. And yeah, I see uh, she's gone all solves it to try and escape. It kind of feels like it, right? So, all right. So, uh, they're saying an appellate court in Virginia on the issue of punitive damages or whether or where actual malice must be proven must independently decide whether the evidence on the record of appeal is sufficient to support a finding of New York Times actual malice by clear and convincing proof. So this is actually watering down the statement they just made, right? They said basically you sort of find things in favor of the non-moving party. And I mean, I will just say again, you know, saying the non-moving party to describe Amber Heard when she had a movement on his bed, uh, they're never going to put that into a court filing, but it, it amuses me. All right. In addition, questions of law are subject to de novo review. So let's talk about what it means to have de novo review. So on appeal, there's various different sort of standards of appeal. And standards of appeal are... Uh, they're boring, but they're also important because cases are won and lost on standards of review. And uh, so de novo basically means that it's, you know, a new. It means that the appellate court is able to appeal that or to look at this on appeal as a entirely fresh uh, matter, as it as as if they were the first people to ever look at it. So what they're saying is that they're not uh, they're not bound by to, to have any deference to the appellate or to the lower court. So that is basically where they're going with this. And I think it's this is an important point. And assuming they're correct here, this is an excellent point to be uh, to be making here. I see uh, I, I usually think of it as from scratch. Yes. Um, as compared to, for instance, an appeal on a reasonableness standard, you know, a reasonableness standard is a deferential standard 
where you are going to basically give a lot of credit to the original decision. So uh, they're not, they're saying they don't have to do that. All right. Um, under most circumstances, whether a person is an employee or an independent contractor is generally a question of fact for the jury. You might be saying, wait a minute, why are they putting this in there? Isn't this against their point? And it is. But you have to put that sort of thing in there, you know, because otherwise the court will con will be like, hey, you've got to be fair to this. But they then turn this around and they say, but where, as here, the evidence admits of only one conclusion, the question is a matter of law. I really think that this is well written in terms of turning around a bad legal principle for the Brown Rudnick team and turning it around and making it a, uh, you know, try to spin it as a, a, a good point here. So, uh, just looking here. <clears throat> Sounds like the PC way of saying the jury was wrong. I mean, the jury is almost never wrong. Um, the jury can sometime, I mean, the jury can be wrong, but the jury has to be real wrong before an appellate court's going to step in which is why they're trying to say, listen, the judge was wrong to even give it to the jury, right? So it's it's not that the jury's wrong, it's bad judge shouldn't have given this to the jury. And I say bad judge, you know, in the sense of like, you know, waggling a finger here. Not that Judge A is a bad judge overall, because um, Judge Asgarati impressed the hell out of me. And if you saw the... Uh, the shooter trial where you had the judge, uh, you know, hugging the prosecution. Oh my God, judge, judge a, I can't imagine would ever do that. She doesn't seem like a really, uh, huggy kind of person. Although quite frankly, like between you and me, I would love to sit down with judge a and just go for a beer. Cause I bet she is fun. Um, but <laughs> I don't think that'll ever happen. All right. Ms. Hurd presented no evidence at trial that Mr. Depp was personally involved in directing or making the Waldman statements. And I mean, how could she, right? Or how would that have been possible? So, um, I mean, they would have had to have gotten that from either Mr. Depp, who denied it, or Mr. Waldman, who quite properly was like, yeah, all of this is privileged and you get nothing, go away, uh, because it is quite properly privileged. Uh, Instead, she chose to pursue a pure vicarious liability claim against uh, Mr. Depp, contending that he was liable for Mr. Waldman's allegedly defamatory statements simply because Mr. Waldman was his attorney. Ms. Hurd's proposed jury instructions on her counterclaim, which the trial court adopted and gave to the jury, were based solely on a vicarious liability theory and did not require a finding of any conduct by Mr. Depp in connection with the Waldman statements. That claim fails on a threshold issue whether, as a matter of law, Mr. Depp can be held liable for the intentional tort of defamation based solely on statements made by his attorney on a pure agency theory. So again, this is, you know, uh, going on about uh, that critical distinction. Um, I see somebody's asking, does Canada have a similar approach to the concept of jury nullification as the U.S., i.e. the jury has the power to say, I don't like this prosecution slash law? Um Jury nullification is forbidden in Canada, but we also have no way of stopping it. And there is at least um, there is at least one famous, famous case. And that is um, I'm going to cover it at some point, although it's going to piss a lot of people off when I do. Um, and that is the case of Morgenthaler. And Morgenthaler is the key abortion case in Canada. Uh, when I cover it, it's going to make a lot of people. And, um, so, uh, a lot of people upset cause it's a contentious issue, but, um, uh, yeah, let's, uh, we'll have to do that. And I, and I see, Hey, Runkle, thank you for covering this. Just wanted to suggest the GitHub copy lot lawsuit as it's the first class action case in the U S to challenge the training and output of AI system. Ooh, interesting. Um, I will have to look into that one. I can't, I will admit I'm not familiar with it, but I will have to look into it. So in the context of vicarious liability, Virginia has long recognized the distinction between servants and independent contractors and follows the well-established rule that the, 
that a principal is generally not liable for the tortious conduct of an independent contractor. So again, I talked about employees versus independent contractors. They're talking about servants versus independent contractors. I suspect that Virginia, um, Virginia is an older state than Alberta. And so I think that this is older language that they're using here. But um, yeah, I mean, if you hire somebody to paint the place, if they're not an employee, you know, they're probably an independent contractor. Uh, are you going to be liable? Same thing with like window cleaners, right? Um, if you hire a, a window washer who is just, uh, you know, who's going up to clean your windows, right? You're probably not able to hire and fire specific employees of the window washing company. You're probably not able to tell them what to do. And so if they end up dropping a bucket of water off the side, um, then you as the sort of building owner, probably not at fault. And I see uh, somebody else is saying, Emily uh, said that the servant is a, the equivalent of a hired employee. Just a holdover from 1800s case law. Yeah, it's just uh, sometimes you get this archaic language, and I think that that's what is going on here. But it's pretty clear there that this is the same employee versus independent uh, contractor distinction that caused me all sorts of headaches when I was taking torts. So uh, way back in the day. All right. So liability on an employer for the negligence acts of its employees, i.e. its servants, but not for the negligent acts of an independent contractor and declining to adopt an exception to this rule for the tortious actions of an independent contractor who was an ostensible or apparent agent. That's key because lawyers are, um, lawyers are a bit of a, an unusual thing, right? Because sometimes lawyers um, can act on your behalf without necessarily your direct say so, right? And we might be able to do things as your agent. Like, you know, let's say I'm in court and uh, the the judge is saying, okay, well, we're going to have to adjourn this. What day do you want to adjourn this to? And I say, well, um, how about, you know, three weeks from now? Well, I probably didn't call the client and say, hey, um, is three weeks good? I don't really, you know, I just, that's when is good for me. I'm going to be there in three weeks, right? Um, so I'm acting as the agent in that sense, but I'm also not, you know, checking with the client as to whether or not that's okay. So that's, uh, <laughs> I see. Uh, or maybe I should draw a wrinkle defending a ham sandwich against EDB with Judge A presiding. That would be funny. Um and I see, would you do the Toronto courthouse case where the, a lawyer was shot and killed during a divorce case, please? 1979s, my dad was a juror, took the secret to his grave. That is, that's interesting. I'll have to check in and see if I can find anything on that one. So the theory on which the master is held liable for his servant's conduct is based on the right of the master, actual or potential, to control that conduct and see to it that negligent acts which cause injury to others do not occur. So again, right, if you are, you know, if I am Walmart and I'm talking about specific Walmart employees, well, then, you know, I can tell this person exactly what to do. I can say, you know, which brush they should use to scrub up the mess. I should use which, um, you know, I can tell them which everything, right? But not so much with an independent contractor. And so this is important when you start looking at lawyers because when you like as a lawyer the client can make some broad strokes decisions as to what they want to do like they can say hey i want to you know i want to plead not guilty i want to take this to trial that's absolutely the client's right uh but in terms of like here is the script i want you to do for this cross-examination i can tell the client no i'm not doing that like i'm doing it my way because I'm the lawyer. So uh, in assessing whether a person is an independent contractor, courts consider four factors. One, selection and engagement. Two, payment of compensation. Three, power of dismissal. And four, power to control the work of the individual. And they note that the fourth factor, the power to control, is determinative. 
So that one tells you everything, but if you don't have that one, then you'd look at the other three. So then they go on to do something that is, this is fairness up to the court, right? Mr. Depp has not been able to identify any Virginia Supreme Court authority squarely considering the specific issues of whether an attorney retained in connection with litigation is an independent contractor and whether the principle limiting liability for conduct of an independent contractor applies in the principal agent context, specifically with respect to the attorney-client relationship. They're saying, we looked, we looked real hard, but we couldn't find any case law directly on point. And that is, um, that's fair. Uh, it's fair for them to tell the court that. Notably, the Virginia Supreme Court has cited with apparent approval uh, the uh, restatement's approach, which limits liability of a principal for the actions of a non-servant agent. Okay. And they note that although other jurisdictions are not uniform, the majority rule and the rule that should be adopted by the court is that an attorney retained by a client for litigation though undoubtedly an agent of the client in the litigation, nonetheless stands in the capacity of a non-servant agent, i.e. an independent contractor, and therefore the client is generally not vicariously liable for the lawyer's misconduct, absent exceptions to the general rule not present here. So they're, they know, they're saying like, listen, the case law on this in Virginia, we couldn't find any, none in Virginia. But other jurisdictions that have looked at this most of them go the direction we like. And that's always a happier place to be. Um, and so, and they say that this is something that the court should itself adopt. Uh, now, having the weight of authority is, is useful. However, you ideally, you want to also be able to support this by principle, right? You want to convince them not only is this something that... Um, uh, uh, not only is this something where you're sort of uh, trying to, you know, say this is how other courts are doing, but you also want to tell the appellate court that this is the right decision as well, right? So, um, so that's uh, that's critical there. I see there's something that no one is addressing out. You, EDB, Nate, Legal Mindset, Joe, Ron Coleman, Legal Bites, Vices, and your contemporaries. You know who they are. I apologize for leaving people out. Pneumonia. I'm not actually sure what you're talking about. So, um, cool. <laughs> All right. So they note uh, a law firm an attorney working with a client is nonetheless an independent contractor and not an employee of the client corporation. Uh, independent counsel retained to conduct litigation in the courts act in the capacity of independent contractors. And I mean, let's consider this one, right? Um, let's say that you, you know, let's say I'm driving to court to represent, you know, Bob and on the way to represent Bob, I run over Frank and Frank is hurt real bad. Should Bob be on the hook because I ran over Frank, right? Um, that's the, um, you know, that's sort of the question that we're asking here, because if the answer to that is no, and I kind of feel like it's no, right? Because Frank doesn't quite, you know, uh, Bob, like my client, if he tells me, hey, listen, I need you to take the bus to court instead of driving. I can tell Bob to go F himself um, with a cactus. I could you know, like, sorry, Bob, you don't get to tell me how I, how I get to work. Um, you know, if Bob says, Hey, listen, um, I'm going to provide you with a company car to do this. I could be like, well, um, thanks for the idea, but I'm, I'd rather drive my own car. You know, I don't, Bob doesn't have that degree of control over me as a lawyer. Uh, he, you know, he doesn't get to pick which suit I wear. He doesn't get to pick, you know, any of this stuff. So Bob doesn't seem to exert sort of traditional employee uh, roles. Whereas if you think of like the pizza delivery driver, right? Or like the UPS delivery driver. Uh, let's say, you know, let's say I'm working for UPS and I'm delivering packages to houses. 
And UPS says, hey, you're going to drive the UPS truck. And I go, nah, I totally want to drive my Honda Civic. I think I can fit all the packages in it. It gets better gas mileage. I'm going to drive the Honda Civic. Um, UPS can totally fire me if I was working for UPS and, you know, driving some non-standard car. Um, so I actually, I think that this is a really good argument. Uh, I see Bob, did someone mention my name? Uh, not that Bob. I, uh, I can't say that I represent that specific Bob. Uh, so that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so they note a general retention of an attorney to do all things necessary to pursue a claim or defense should in legal contemplation mean the attorney has a authority to do all things legal and proper, not otherwise. We will not presume a direction or authority or permission to uh, commit a tortious or illegal act and here's in the usual attorney-client relationship. So, you know, you don't give permission to your, your attorney to commit crimes or torts. Um, makes sense to me. So, and they note here... Uh, when, as here, an attorney acts pursuant to the exercise of an independent professional judgment, he or she acts presumptively as an independent contractor whose intentional misconduct may generally not be imputed to the client. So, you know, yeah, all of this is, these are really good quotes. Uh, attorneys generally are not subject to their client's actual control or direction. There is a degree to which I take directions from clients, right? If the client says, listen, I don't want you calling this witness because, um, you know, I think that this would be really embarrassing for me. And, you know, that's one of my objectives. I can be like, okay, um, fair ball. We're not going to call that witness. You can make that direction. But they can't direct, like, the flow of my cross-examination. That's too far. Um they can't direct, you know, what exactly I say. And the notion that a, uh, the notion that my clients are necessarily on the hook for all the things I say, like I got a YouTube channel, folks. Um, I say all sorts of things on my YouTube channel and I don't talk about my clients on my YouTube channel, but none of the stuff I say here should be imputed to any of my clients in any fashion. Like if I say something stupid, that should be on me right now. Um, so <clears throat> yeah. All right. So carrying on here. Uh, so they say the mere fact that an agency relationship existed between the client appellees and the attorney appellees does not mean that the client appellees would automatically be liable for any tortious conduct unless a client is implicated in some way other than uh, merely being represented by the attorney alleged to have committed the intentional wrongful conduct. The client cannot be liable for the attorney's conduct. So let's take a really ridiculous example here. Let's say that Johnny Depp's lawyers, you know, uh, you know, Camille just has had it. And, you know, let's say she goes and she runs over Amber, like just runs over her with her car. Um, and that didn't happen, you know, just for the record. And it's not likely to happen. But this is a purely hypothetical, you know, scenario here. Um, unless Johnny said, hey, you know what? You should go run over Amber. He shouldn't be on the hook for that, right? So... There's obviously got to be a limit there on on all of that. So, yeah, it's uh, they make other notes here about lawyers as legal professionals typically are not subject to their client's control with respect to the manner in which they provide their services. Uh, if clients cannot control the details of their attorney's work, it makes little sense that clients should nonetheless be held accountable for their attorney's tortious actions. That's the entire rationale behind this, right? That's the entire um, that's the entire rationale for the vicarious liability aspect is that, you know, Walmart controls Walmart's employees. 
UPS controls UPS's employees, but like Walmart, when they order a package, doesn't control UPS's employees and therefore wouldn't be held on the hook. I really think this is a good argument. I think this is an argument that should win. Somebody was asking me about chances. And here's the problem. Uh, appeals are always an uphill battle. Always. Um, you can have the best appeal in your life. And, you know, I've walked into the appeals courts with really good arguments, like really strong, in my opinion, arguments. And the client's like, what do you think our chances are? I'm like, well, um, I think there's no way you should possibly be able to lose this one. So 60%. The client goes, what? They go, you should absolutely win this. Like the law is on our side. The facts are on our side. Everything says we should win and 60%. And the clients are horrified. And it's like, welcome to appeals courts. You know, we're trying to change people's minds. Um, it's hard. So, um, you know, 50-50 at this stage. I want to read the response brief before I get too far into making decisions. But, um, yeah, I... Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I have not been impressed with Amber Heard's team's uh, assignment of errors, although that's really, that doesn't tell us a whole lot yet. But I really want to see, I want to see how they do when they're actually writing a full appeals brief. And you better believe I will do another stream like this and uh, and we'll go. <laughs> I see uh, Dam Runkle, we're running people down as fast as uh, DB in a Christmas parade tonight. I'm sorry, but a lot of vicarious liability claims, a lot of vicarious liability claims are about car accidents. A tremendous amount. Because a tremendous amount of torts claims are about car accidents. It's one of the most common ways people get um, get injured. And so... Can people hear me? Hopefully, uh, hopefully the mic is now back. Can people hear me? All right. I didn't mean to mute it. I accidentally kicked my uh, <laughs> accidentally kicked my mic cable out of my uh, my uh, microphone. All right. So. Um, yeah, a lawyer shall abide by the client's decisions concerning the objectives of representation and shall consult with the client as to the means by which they are to be pursued. I hate not that the client gets to decide what they are. So, um, yeah, and they also note further, a client is prohibited from advancing frivolous arguments on behalf of a client, even if the client tells you and is permitted to refuse to present evidence on behalf of a client that the lawyer reasonably believes is false. So the lawyer actually has to make some determination. And I have had to, uh, you know, I've had clients who are like, here is, um, you know, stuff from, for like a bail hearing. And I look at it and I go, okay, that's nice. Uh, this confirmation of employment, um, that's great. It's completely horseshit and I'm not showing it to the court. Um, sometimes you got to do that. 
And a lawyer is in some required to exercise professional expertise beyond that of the typical client, because this is why the client hires you, right? Like, you know, everybody watch the Daryl Brooks trial. Um, if you watch the Daryl Brooks trial, did you see how well he did? Not well, right? Um, you would expect a lawyer to do better than that. And in fact, uh, there were some reasonable arguments that could have been made in his trial, and he made none of them competently. So, um, and some of the arguments that Daryl Brooks advanced, in fact, you, I as a lawyer could not advance in court. Um, you know, hey, um, go and tell the, uh, you know, like the whole thing about like, Oh, subject matter jurisdiction. And, you know, could you present the state to us? Like, none of that is like I would be expected as a lawyer if my client was asking me to make those kinds of arguments to tell my client, okay, um, that's a neat strategy that you can, you know, that we are totally not pursuing and you're invited to go to hell. And, you know, we're not doing that. Um so the lawyer is expected to uh, to make these calls. And they also note, in any case, the typical client who generally lacks legal expertise cannot monitor the conduct of a lawyer for wrongful activity. This is part of why people hire lawyers, right? Amber Heard went to a lawyer to consult as to how to not get found to be defamatory when writing a statement that was defamatory um that lawyer did a shit job by the way <laughs> um i mean assuming that the lawyer said hey go ahead and publish this uh i don't know what was going on behind the scenes but i'm just like you know you had one job advising as to how not to get found to be defamatory and it was found to be defamatory so um so they note that as a uh, client's agent, a lawyer's conduct may be binding on the client with respect to positions taken in litigation or in a business con or transaction. But to hold the client liable for the attorney's intentional tort goes a step too far and is fundamentally inconsistent with the logic behind independent contractor principles of limited liability. So, you know, this is getting back to our example. Like, let's say... Um, Let's say I am negotiating a, you know, a, a merger between two companies and I send my lawyer off to that merger meeting to, dis, you know, to negotiate terms. Well, that lawyer might be able to bind me to a particular contractual wording. But if that lawyer, you know, shows up drunk and punches the other side's lawyer and then pees on the carpet and, you know whatever, um, I shouldn't myself be held liable for the punch or the carpet. Like that's, you know, so yeah, I see people saying Hogue. Hogue would never. Hogue is way too much of a sweetheart, but you get the idea. So, um, so that's basically the argument that they're making here. And they're saying the uncontroverted evidence was that Mr. Depp never even saw the Waldman statements prior to seeing Ms. Hurd's counterclaim in August 2020. So the only reason to say that there's liability is the lawyer uh, relationship. And I think they make a really good case for that not being sufficient. So I like this argument. I think it's persuasively stated. Um, I want to see the counter argument. I want to see what Amber Heard's team comes up with because I think that this is, um, I think this is a real strong, uh, you know, strong aspect here. So Ms. Heard presented no evidence of Mr. Waldman's actual malice. All right. So this is just a no evidence claim. So this one's going to be fairly or a little shorter. Um, and basically they're just going to keep repeating that there was no, no evidence that uh, that there was any sort of actual malice uh, or that Mr. Depp was directly involved. Uh, they note that vicarious liability is the liability for the tort of another person. 
And so it cannot proceed against an employer or principal absent of showing that the agent or employee committed a tort. So let's say, let's go back to our example of I hire, you know, I have a trucking company and one of my uh, truck drivers drives into a building, right? Well, let's say that employee um, was directed to, like, let's say the customer says, hey, please, and I don't know why the customer would, but let's say the ultimate customer said, hey, um, can you please park this truck in the building? Like, just drive right through the front of the building. And my driver goes, sure, I can do that. Well, if he had permission to do that, then it's not tortious conduct, right? And then I can't be held responsible as the employer for that driving the truck into the building if it was not a tort in the first place. That's basically the argument here is, you know, you haven't shown that this was a, a tort at all. And therefore, so the first argument is, even if it's a tort, Mr. Depp isn't liable. And then this one is, even if Mr. Depp is liable for these actions, it's not a tort in the first place. So there's these two kind of feed into each other. And either of these is enough to, uh, to say that this, you know, should win. And I should stop here. I've got a bunch of super chats. So let me catch up on those before I get too far. Years ago, my doctor suggested a cough med for me. Bourbon, brown sugar, make it thick, then take a teaspoonful slowly does work. I may have to give that a try. Uh, can the judge contact the appeals court and say, I read the brief and the appellant is correct. I erred. Would it mean anything if they did? I don't think that is proper. Um, so I don't think that they would. Um, it should be up to the appeals court. Uh, props to you for donating, not pledging. Well, it you got to be a real crappy person to pledge to donate and then not actually you know, follow through. What kind of person would do that about a children's hospital? Yeah. Just happy to see you better and back on YouTube. It's I was missing this so badly. I was sitting there, um, Rob at one point, uh, and he was right to do so, but he was just like, if you try to join this stream, I will kick you out. And I'm like, that's fair. That is, that is right. And, um, so, all right. So let's uh, have a look here. I see she never even signed the pledge paperwork either. Yeah, I mean, it's just complete horse crap. Uh, oh, just read that one. Please feel better. Glad you're back. Well, thank you. It's good to be back. Uh, Debbie D.O.B., thank you very much for the very generous super sticker. Uh, Catherine Rourke, uh, also thank you for the very generous super sticker. Uh, Catherine Rourke, uh, percentage wise and on condition of legal soundness, what are Depp's chances of winning all the points of his appeal? He doesn't need to win all the points. And I would actually say that the chances of him winning all of the points are probably zero. And the reason why is because it's very common for appeals courts, very common. <coughs> Sorry, I just had a little, uh, hitch in my throat there. Very common for appeals courts to say, listen, uh, we are finding for Depp on point one, and we're not going to look at the other ones at all. So it would not surprise me in the slightest if they started out with the first point and they said, we think this is excellent, we think this is good, and we don't need to look at the others. So um, I would be actually quite surprised if they uh, if they ruled on all the points. So, but I think he's got a good chance of winning on at least that first point. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, good boy yourself. Well, thank you. Uh, and Miriam uh, Petrosova, I hope I'm getting that right. Thank you very much for the super sticker. All right. So let's uh, sort of dive back in here. I see in the eyes of the public, Depp has won. Absolutely. And EDB said the points were laid out strongest to weakness. So far, I think that's the case. Um, so they also note uh, it is well settled in Virginia that where master and servant are sued together in tort and the master's liability, if any, is solely dependent on the servant's conduct. A verdict for the servant necessarily exonerates the master. That 
is from a 1988 case, and I would have expected older because the language is old. But um, like that's it's a good it's a good phrasing of it. I really like that phrasing in terms of that. So basically, all of this is just to say, you remember the whole actual malice thing from the trial? I mean, I know you guys were there. I know you guys saw it. Um, actual malice, again, doesn't mean like, you know, cackling with evil. It means subjective knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard as to whether it was false or not. It seems like it's very difficult to establish that you know, this aspect that the defendant realized that his statement was false or that he subjectively entertained serious doubt as to the truth of his statement. In fact, Waldman um, quite repeatedly said that he believed his statements to be true. And I think Waldman actually has a pretty good argument for believing his statements to be true because Waldman, you know, Waldman tried to file perjury charges. Like, come on, how? Yeah, I, I think it's difficult for the jury to get to actual malice. So consequently, actual malice is not measured by whether a reasonably prudent man would have published or would have investigated before publishing. Uh, there must be sufficient evidence to permit the conclusion that the defendant in fact, entertain serious doubts as to the truth of this publication. There's no sign that Waldman ever did so. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that if you, you know, let's say I was in London right now and I stopped, you know, Mr. Waldman and said, hey, let's go for it. I was going to say a coffee, except he'd probably say a tea. And, uh, you know, let's talk about this. I bet Mr. Waldman would say exactly the same things today. I think he believes that they're, uh, you know, believes that they're accurate. Uh, this little footnote is that no one dis has disputed that Ms. Hurd is a public figure who must meet the actual malice standard as she's a well-known actress whose activities are widely reported in the media. Um, yeah, I, I don't see how they could argue. Um, I don't see how Ms. Hurd could argue that it was not, that she's not a public figure given that her claims really depend on her being the most famousest actress ever because she was playing Mira and this was going to be the biggest moment of her. Oh my fucking. So yeah. Um, I tried watching that movie. I'm just going to say it. I didn't get far. Um, it, it wasn't for me. I didn't actually get to Amber Heard being, <laughs> so like it wasn't amber heard it was just the movie was not great so i i didn't get through it so um yeah i see uh the movie was bad yeah it's the biggest dc movie ever or something um yeah it was not a good movie it just it wasn't the notion that this movie was like the thing that was gonna take her to johnny depp levels of career um, no, no. Um, yeah. And I see the thing about she's as big as Gal Gadot and Zendaya. I, I love that expert who was just like Zendaya goes by one name. End of story as to comparing them. So, um, uh, all right. So yeah, that's basically this one. I don't think that there's a whole lot of need to go through this one in further detail. Uh, they're just noting that there was no evidence with that of actual malice. I agree with it, but I think it's actually the weaker argument than the first one. Because the first one... So the second one is kind of an evidentiary issue, and they could say, listen, it's the jury's call as to whether or not there was evidence, because the jury gets to decide on a holistic basis and i mean i think that's wrong but you know whatever um the first one is not only like this is a purely legal point but it's this is a purely legal point that actually raises substantial public interest uh aspects to it right like get the law right here otherwise you're gonna screw things up for all sorts of things so um i like the first one better 
in fact, Mr. Waldman testified that he'd filed a claim with the LAPD against uh, Ms. Heard for perjury due to the claims that Mr. Depp abused her and that he presented them with information that he believed established her perjury. Yeah, does that sound like a guy who thinks he's lying or thinks he's making it up? I I don't think so. Um, so, uh, yeah, they make specific notes that they can't rely on any inference from uh, attorney-client privilege. Um, that's pretty much trite law. So in context, the Waldman statements are not actionable. So this is basically to point out that uh, pure expressions of opinion not amounting to fighter words cannot uh, form the basis of an action for defamation. So, you know, I think Heard is a bad person, is a pure statement of opinion, and cannot be the basis of defamation. Uh, go ahead, Heard. Sue me over that one. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, However, even a provably false statement is not actionable if it is plain that the speaker is expressing a subjective view, an interpretation, a theory, conjecture, or surmise, rather than claiming to be in possession of objectively verifiable facts. I think this is a weaker one, and I'll tell you why. I think this one is actually contradicted by the one that they just argued. Because if Waldman is going and expressing an opinion, well, he just went to the police to file perjury charges. So I don't think that this is the strongest aspect. Um, so, I mean, I think that there was, that this did go behind, beyond opinion. And I think that the court is entirely reasonable. I think that it's reasonable for the court to, uh, you know, to come to that position. So, but they're basically saying if it's purely opinion um and then he wouldn't be on the hook for it so let's see regarding i think hurt is not a good person if you thought she was a good person that would almost be defamation against humanity yeah um did waldman say he had like a folder full of shit when he went to file perjury charges yeah he said he had a big you know collection of documents so i think I don't like this one as much. And um, I know there's going to be some people in the chat and so forth. who are going to be like, Hey, um, you know, you're on the wrong side on this one. I don't think this is, uh, I, I don't see the likely, I don't see it as likely that uh, the appellate court would rule in depth's favor on this point. Um, I think if he loses the other two, he's going to lose this one too. Um, I suspect that we're much more likely to see the uh, him win on the first one and them saying we're not going to rule on the other two. And sometimes they don't rule on the other ones because they're just like it's unnecessary. And sometimes they don't rule on the other ones because they think they're bad. So, um, yeah, they know Mr. Waldman never claims personal knowledge of what happened on May 21st, 2016 at Mr. Depp's and Ms. Hurd's shared penthouses. And no one disputes this. Um, they note that he's offering his own interpretation of disputed evidence. Uh, I don't know if that one... I don't like this argument. Uh, I'm just going to say that, you know, I just, I don't. I get why they're making it, um, but I don't like the argument. I don't think it's going to fly. I, I just... So... Um, Non-actionable opinion. Fair. I mean, that's, it's, it's an argument. I just, I don't think, I think this one's too easy to poke holes in uh, with the, the trial record and with sort of reasonable inferences on all of that. So um, they note each acknowledged Mr. Waldman's bias and status as an attorney for Mr. Depp. Nietzsche ultimately expressed Mr. Waldman's own interpretation of the weight, reliability, and credibility of conflicting evidence, but which he did not claim to and did not have direct first-hand personal knowledge. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. I see... Uh, 
Josh Drew told Waldman they did set it up. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, say too much on, I just, I don't, I think that it's possible for a reasonably instructed, uh, you know, jury to say, we think that this, these were statements of fact rather than opinion. That's where I get to on that. Um, I think it's worth making the argument. I just don't think it's going to fly. All right. So jury instructions are reviewed under an abuse of discretion standard. That's a much rougher standard than a de novo standard, right? Um, so in reviewing a trial court's decision to refuse jury instructions, the evidence is reviewed in the light most favorable to the proponent of the instruction. That's a real brutal standard. So um, that that already tells us that this is going to be a hard sell on appeal, right? This review standard is, is tough. Um, all right. If a proffered instruction finds any support in credible evidence, its refusal is reversible error. Okay, so that's... Maybe I'm misreading what they're saying here. Um, so yes, or sorry, in reviewing a trial court's decision to refuse jury instructions, the evidence is reviewed in the light that's most... So, and there's... Okay, yes, and they're saying that this is instructions that should not have been reviewed. So sorry, this is not a a rough standard. This is a very favorable standard. I was getting that backwards. Um, so this is a very favorable standard of review for them on that in that case. So uh, they propose jury instruction 22, an independent contractor is a person who is engaged to produce a specific result, but who is not subject to the control of the employer slash principal as to the way he brings about that result. Um, if you find that Mr. Waldman was acting on Mr. Depp's behalf, it was not subject to Mr. Depp's control as to the manner, method, and or means by which Mr. Waldman worked, you must find that Mr. Waldman was an independent contractor. Um, and 24, a person who hires an independent contractor is not liable for the independent contractor's actions. If you find that Mr. Waldman was an independent contractor of Mr. Depp instead of an employee, you may not find Mr. Depp liable for Mr. Waldman's conduct. So this is basically point one, but going back to the jury instructions. So um, they note, they incorporate by reference and will not repeat at length the arguments set forth above regarding Mr. Waldman's status as an independent contractor. But they're saying basically this jury instruction should have been put to the jury. Um, seems reasonable to me. Uh, again, I thought that the first argument, their first point here, which they're tying back to, um, is an excellent one. Um, trial court erred in excluding the full articles, which is again reviewed under an abuse of discretion standard. And they're just going to point out that these provide the necessary context into showing. And I mean, if you're trying to say, hey, listen, um, like if you're trying to determine whether this was defamatory or an opinion, then you do need that context, right? That seems like that makes sense to me. So, um, and they make that point. They say, ultimately, this is how the readers understood Mr. Waldman's statement as presenting one side's interpretation of evidence gathered in hotly contested litigation. That's not a bad point, because if you do read the full article, um, they, they have, you know, they do sort of a both sides kind of thing. And when the article itself does a both sides kind of point, then it's a lot harder to take that as a factual statement. So, yeah, I I don't think this is a bad argument. I think it's a good argument. Um, so, you know, I think that this is a good point. Um, we'll have to see ultimately on that, but... Uh, Conclusion that they should reverse the judgment on Ms. Hurd's counterclaim as to the April 27th Waldman statement, but should otherwise affirm the judgment in Mr. Depp's favor. Um, so basically just don't uh, mess with the judgment other than that. And then, of course, we've got our star team here. Uh, Dennison, we've got uh, Camille, we've got uh, Ben Chu, Aaron Crawford. That's a whole team to be working on this uh, appellate brief. So... Uh, so, yep. 
All right. So that's basically that. I think it's a good... I think it's a pretty good... Um, uh, I think it's a pretty good, um, you know, bit of writing. I want to see the other side, as always. Like, I really want to see how that uh, shakes down. Uh, but I think that this is a pretty solid uh, bit of legal writing. I think that this is really... Um, I'm impressed because in a lot of places, this is very... Um, legal writing is hard. I'm just going to say that right off. Um, you know, even just like short briefs are really hard to do. And so, um, it's, I, I think that they did a really good job here because this is very readable. This is very, um, like, I think this is something that I could hand to somebody who's not a, uh, not a lawyer and hand this to them and have them follow the reasoning to it. But I also think that it's something where as a lawyer, uh, I look at it and I go, Ooh, I really like where they're going here. Maybe not so much here, but you know, I think that their first point is the best of them. Um, I don't think it's close. I think their first point is the kind, it makes the kind of arguments that, that sort of scare appellate courts into action. So, um, but I really like the reading on, you know, the writing on this because um, lots of people who uh, who write appellate briefs write them in ways that are just obnoxious. And uh, and I see uh, Cat Steele said, I finally looked at your Canadian Supreme Court brief and found it easy to read, surprisingly. I actually thought that uh, um, I... I try to make my, you know, my writing uh, easy to read, but I think they did a better job on their brief than I did on my Supreme Court brief. In fact, I would hope so because holy crap, they have a lot of, uh, that's like, I don't know, eight, nine lawyers on this. Um, that appellate brief cost more than my car. Like, actually cost more than both of my cars easily. So um, now I will say that, you know, one thing I haven't gone through here and that I would want to do if I was the other side, and in fact, I'll probably go through and do in the meantime, is go and read every citation. Because if you are, um, if you're arguing something at, a, at an appeals court, you want to know every citation that the other side is relying on and every citation you're relying on you need to be able to just uh you know you need to know those better than anybody in the room because the appellate court might ask you about them so uh i haven't done that at this stage i'm taking sort of taking them at their word that the the cases they cite are that they mean what they say they mean and that none of them have been overturned um, I don't think that the that this is the team that's going to make that kind of screw up, but um, you never know. I've seen that you know done from other people. All right, and I see uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's because Johnny trusts his attorneys, and his attorneys trust him. So different from the other side. I really loved seeing the uh, the relationship there. And I see. Will we see Gimlet tomorrow? I will be there for Lawyers and Dragons. Um, so when Lawyers and Dragons starts, I'm going to throw up something on this stream to say, uh, hey, go check me out on on Lawyers and Dragons. Uh, just so if anybody checks in, they'll see that. And But I'm going to be over there on, uh, on the Lawyers and Dragons stream because I wouldn't miss that. So uh, I really hope you become a lecturer in the future if that is what you want. Um, I've always enjoyed teaching law school courses. But I get to teach more people. Um, I've got 1,500 people in this stream right now. And I can tell you, um, I've never had 1,500 people in a law school course. So I get to share my love of the law with a lot more people here than, uh, you know, than anything else. Uh, I see 
Barry Foreman, why are you pretending to be Ian? I I assume that's a comment about the beard. Um, yeah, I I'm not sure if I'll keep it, but uh, I will at least. Uh, I'm gonna let people on the extra live stream decide on uh, on that one. So I uh, got a couple of super chats there. He knew the individual facts were false. His theory of the timeline, as stated, was absolutely not correct. That's how I read that argument. That's uh, that's a possibility. And does notwithstanding clause mean government can ignore human rights and constitution as long as they say so, like martial law? If so, can the UN invade Canada like Haiti? Um, there are limits on the notwithstanding clause and what it can overrule. I should do a video on it. Um, but, um, yeah. I see Elon Free Speech Musk suspended my Twitter account today for hateful speech because I wrote on his Twitter feed, Elon going schizo in reference to a small chat and voices in his head comments. Um, so, yeah, we'll have to see. I will probably pop in to Friday Night Frenzy at least for a little bit. Um, and uh, But uh, for right now, I'm going to go run, and uh, I got to do some errands. I got to... I need Coke. Uh, not, not the nose kind, the beverage kind. Um, you know, just to be clear. Uh, I need energy drinks, I need snacks, and I need to go hit the post office. So I'm going to do all of those things, and then I'll pop in to Friday Night Frenzy for at least a little bit. Uh, at least I'm hoping to. And so I'm going to wrap this up. I've got a redirect set up, so hopefully when I hit, uh, when I hit uh, sort of uh, end broadcast, hopefully it should kick everybody over to the waiting room for Friday Night Frenzy. So... All right, I will uh, see you guys there. And I and uh, see Rob's going to block you. I don't think so, but uh, we'll see. All right, uh, see you guys at uh, over at uh, Rob's for Friday Night Frenzy. Cheers.